A little bit about me first. I've been an R user for around six years. I first learned at Rice University, where I went for undergraduate. I'm currently a data scientist at DataCamp. I started just uh, two weeks ago. For those of you who aren't familiar with them, they're a data science online education company, and they're sponsoring this conference, so you can go learn more about them at the booth. And a couple of things I enjoy talking about if you find me at lunch or um, in the coffee breaks. A-B testing, uh, the talk I gave at Jared's Meetup was all about online experimentation. I did a lot of it at Etsy where I was before and currently helping DataCamp build out um, their platform. Building and finding data science community. This is really why I enjoy being at conferences like this because all the talks are recorded, which is great for those who can't make it. Um, so you, you could see these talks, but really it's the energy in the room, it's the connections that you make when you see people in the coffee and the lunch uh, that makes it so much fun to be here. And finally, of course, R. All right, I have three goals for my talk today. The first is to keep you hip to the lingo. So I'm talking about the tidyverse, but, but what is this tidyverse? Um, you know, what, how, how did it come about and who are the people behind it? And the second is to stop you from doing this. We've all had those moments where we know exactly what we want our data set to look like, how we want to reshape it or the model, and it just won't work. Hope and help solve that by teaching you some useful functions you can start doing right away in your workflow. And finally, point you to some resources. I'm hoping at the end of this talk you'll be excited to learn even more about the tidyverse after understanding better its, um, its breadth and how the functions can work with your data analysis process. And I want to help you start that journey. So that will be the closing part of this talk. All right, the tidyverse. Tidyverse is a set of R packages that are designed to work really well together and to bring you through the data analysis process. This is what the tidyverse universe looks like. Most of us are probably familiar with these steps. First, you have to even get your data into R. Um, then you work on changing it. Maybe you have to munch some dates. Probably you'll try out some visualizations, plotting your data, hopefully with ggplot2. Um, and then the final step is usually to communicate it to other people. You might do that through a shiny interactive dashboard or an R markdown document that you make to a Google Doc um, that you share with stakeholders. And what we see throughout this process is written below the big steps, import, transform, are just some of the tidyverse packages that can help you through this. Now, most of you here are probably familiar with this man. He is going to be speaking. Um, Hadley Wickham, for those of you who don't know, he's the author behind uh, such packages as dplyr and ggplot2. And if you've been around in R for a few years, you might have heard the term the Hadleyverse talking about these packages. So a question could be, is the tidyverse just the Hadleyverse? Is it just Hadley Wickham? The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> Yeah, this is the first time I think I've had Hadley in the audience for this. <laughs> uh, but what I wanted to show with this is that Hadley's done a great job starting this, but here are some of the packages um, in the tidyverse. And these are the people behind them. In some cases, they're the creators of the package. In other cases, they're the current maintainers or active developers without whom the package wouldn't look like how it is today. And that's what I really wanted to emphasize is it's grown, you know, much beyond one person, and really now there are lots of contributors, um, lots of packages in the tidyverse, and it makes it a really exciting place to be. The main part of my talk is gonna be this demonstration. I'm gonna walk through an exploratory data analysis of Kaggle's data science and machine learning survey. This was something they did in um, 2017. They surveyed about 16,000 people, ranging from those just starting in data science to people already in the field, asking questions on their demographic information. Uh, what are their favorite um, learning platforms or what machine learning methods are they excited about next year? And some steps of a data analysis workflow I'll walk through, going from everything to viewing our data set initially, inspecting some different columns, making plots, and maybe everyone's favorite steps, doing something really cool and new. All right, so first step, you just type the name of your data set after you've imported it into your console. And who's ever had this happen? <laughs> where it just takes over the whole thing and you're like, oh no, what, what have I done? What mistakes have I made? And what's happened is you have so many columns and it's printing all of them out and this is really not a useful way to view your data set because it's just completely taken over. And the solution to this is to use the function as tibble from the tibble package. Tibbles are modern data frames and they change a few behaviors about um, data frames, but one of the great ones is that they will only print the first 10 rows and the columns that fit on the screen. 
So what we can see here is those rest of those columns that were the rows of those were all printing out. Now we just see the column name along with its type. So this is you never have to worry about that uh, never ending console screen again, I guess unless you have maybe 10,000 columns. Don't do that. Next up, examine your NAs. Um, as we heard in an earlier talk, missing values can be really important. So how do you take a look and see what those missing values might be? One way you can do it is first you do um, this combination of sum and is.na. Is.na will change the uh, variable country to true or false depending on whether it's missing. Then we sum it, and because true evaluates to 1 and false to 0, that gets us the number of NAs. And using dplyr summarize, we can get this so that now we have um, you know, just a, a one row data set that's the number of NAs, and it's 0. But how can we do this for every column? I don't want to be running through each column name doing this. Here's where per can come in. So per, to me, initially was a very intimidating package. It's all about functional programming. It has a lot of stuff. Um, but I just want to share it with those who aren't familiar how, how you can start using it. And what here I'm going to do is map this function, sum is an A, over every column. The map underscore df says, I want a data frame back. So you have map underscore chr. I want a character back. And that's how you tell, that's, and we can see I do get indeed back a data frame of one row and 228 columns. And what's in the row here is a number of NAs in that column. And the way I've said this is the dot that's in here says, this is where the column should go. This is what I want, where I want you to do the function. And that little tilde just stands for an anonymous function. Um, and this is a really nice way to do something over every column. But what's the problem here? Let's take a look at gender select. It said that there were zero NAs. Well, what do we see here as humans? There are 95 people where it's an empty string. And we recognize that as an A, but R doesn't. And our missing, so our missing values aren't actually an A. To solve this, we can use dplyr's NA if. And this says if uh, its argument is what we want to change to NA. In this case, we want to change an empty string to NA. And now if we once again look at our gender select variable, we see, just as we would hope, the 95 entries are an A. Next step, let's examine some of our numeric columns. But how can we do this quickly? We're going to use a combination of dplyr select if and skim our skim. Select if, if you're probably, you might be familiar with dplyr select, select if says, I only want to select the columns if a condition is met, in this case that they're numeric. And then skim or skim gives us a really quick overview. This is all this, a lot of the summary information you'd probably want, starting with how many are the missing? Um, what's the mean, standard deviation? Uh, what are the percentiles? And finally, probably my favorite feature, the histogram. Where we can, and we can immediately start seeing some things like, oh, we might have a data quality issue because age, the minimum age is zero and the maximum is 100. Probably we didn't have zero year olds taking our survey. Next, let, let's go back and examine a single column. This is the column um, work method select. And I'm just doing a count and I'm seeing, okay, which, um, you know, let, let's summarize the data a bit and see uh, what are the more popular work method select. What's an issue we have here? we can see that this must have been a multiple selection question. So each row is, um, you know, represents like a, a person's answer. And the problem we have here is some of the answers have two work methods selected. Like we see the third row, data visualization, comma, logistic regression. So if we want to understand what's the most popular work method, this is not a really good format for our data to be in. And to help this, we're going to use the stringer function string underscore split. Stringer is all about working with strings. And in this case, we'll say, take that work method select column, split it based on the comma. With that, make a new column, work underscore method. And let's take a look at that. And now what we have is a column of lists. So that first row is a list, is a character list of five entries. And that used to be five things split by four commas, but now we've got a list. But that's still not the format we wanted it to be in. So how can we spread it out so now once again, each row will only have a single entry? And with that, we do tidyr's unnest. So we take this um, data set, which has a list in each row, and we spread it out. And we end up with um, over 68,000 rows, because now it's much longer. And with that, we can start trying to visualize. So let's make a plot. Let's do a plot of, you know, as we wanted to ask, what are the most common work methods? And we have a critical issue with this plot, which is it's a mess. This is not helpful, right? What, what, what the heck are, are these axes? What are the labels? So we're going to do two things to solve this. 
The first is a chord flip. And this is really nice. You, the other option would be you can make your x-axis labels um, vertical instead of horizontal. But I personally like the chord flip a lot. And now we can read it, and, um, and that's, OK, that's more helpful. But we still have a problem. They're not ordered. So let's, let's order them. And with that, we can use forecast, which is one of my favorite packages. It's around um, working with factors. And here we're saying, OK, let's reorder the work method column by n, by the number of people. And now we can see that, oh, great, this is much easier to read. We see we start data visualization. Logistic regression are the most popular, um, versus like GANs are all the way at the bottom, not very popular. Our final step in a data analysis process, right, as we heard, it's, it's maybe just a t 5 or 10% of time, but it's doing something cool and new. And what's the issue we have here? We have no idea what we're doing. So who's run into you? Like you're so excited about a new method, and you're like, I don't even know where to start, or I just ran into a bug, and why isn't my code working? There's a lot of options you have here, such as reading the manual. Um, but another option is that you can uh, ask a question. So you, and you, if you want to make ask a good question, like say on Stack Overflow, R Studio Community, or Twitter, um, a good way to do it is to make a minimal reproducible example, which is all about helping others help you. And we're going to do this with two packages, Tibble and Reprex. And first, just to clarify, a minimal reproducible example is, let's say you asked a question that says, why isn't factory order working? It would be very difficult for anyone to answer that for you, because they wouldn't see your code. They wouldn't know what data set you're working at. But what if your code is uh, 1,000 lines and your data set is proprietary? Well, you can't really share that either. So a minimal reproducible example is about reducing your code to where it's um, to the shortest possible amount of code and data that still illustrates the problem you're having. And this is an optional part, but one way, if you need to make a, a kind of fake data set to do this, you can use Tribble to make a toy data set. And Tribble is how I always dreamed of making data sets in R, which is just um, on the first row, you list your column names with a little tilde before it, and the next row is just all the entries. And here, I'm just saving that as an original data frame. Next step, we can use the package Reprex from Jenny Bryan to find any problems. What do I mean by that? Let's say we have our code. So on the left here, we've said, OK, this is the code that's having a problem. Let me try Reprex. I copy it, I run Reprex. But oh no, I'm having errors. So if someone was running this in a clean R session, they would have errors. And not the errors I want them to have, um, but, but the errors because I haven't loaded the packages. So in this case, if we look at what errors are going to come out, it's, oh, I, don't, I can't find the function vismus. I can't find the function ggplot. We go back to our code and realize we haven't done the library calls. So Reprex will help you find those issues before you post and someone goes back and says, hey, I can't run your code. And then we can use Reprex to post your question or issue. And that's really nice. Say, um, in this case, we're seeing an example where you posted it on, on GitHub. Like, maybe you want to file a bug report with a package. And the nice thing is it formats your code uh, and includes any plots and makes it really easy just to go and submit your issue just by copying it. All right, so this is just an overview of what we went through today, about 11 functions. Like I said, there are so many more, not just packages, but functions within the packages. And that's why I wanted to go over, for, uh, for example, dplyr, which is a very popular package, but many people don't realize the depth of the functions that it has. Uh, and I, at the resource at the end, I'm going to point you to some places where you can find out things like that. First resource is Hadley Wickham's and Garrett Groleman's R for Data Science book. Um, which will probably be given away at this conference. It's available for free online, and it's a really good resource. It's appropriate for both um, beginners, so if you're just starting out in R, but also even for more advanced R users who are looking either to maybe wholesale switch into the tidyverse or have been using the tidyverse but aren't familiar with certain parts, such as maybe working with dates. And then they can go to this book and just jump to the chapter or section on that. Next up is um, the RStats Twitter hashtag. So I'm a big Twitter user. And one of the reasons I like it is it's a very friendly community. In this case, I was saying, I have a, what happened was I had a report that I was writing at Etsy. And I had about 12 plots in it. But I was going to share this with a lot of people, so I wanted to make those plots use the Etsy color scheme. And I knew about theme underscore set, which is a way at the top of your, um, your script, you can set the background for your plot. And that will change all the plots later. But that didn't work for colors. And I wanted to know, how can I change globally change the colors on my plot without having to go and every single plot add the, the color scale that I wanted? And our set Twitter came to the rescue. 
So Ilde Sessler here said, did you know about this package, GG Theme R? Um, here's the functions in it, and here's a blog post I wrote about it. And this was a really um, nice way to um, get, a, get an answer to my question um, that, that the Googling hadn't, hadn't done for me. Next up, our, st our studio has lots of cheat sheets. You can find them at their table in the back. Um, this is Per. I like it, again, as both a reference, but Per is often thought of mainly for its map function. But this is a um, two-sided cheat sheet, and there's so many more functions that you have here. So whether it's you want to dive into a package or you want a one-stop shop for working with strings, you can go to our Studio Cheat Sheets um, and find those. Now, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, my company, DataCamp. I actually had this in my presentation even before I worked with them, and, and that's part of why I was so excited to join. Um, as I mentioned, it's a data science online education company, and it's a little bit different. We have a couple of things. We have projects and problem sets, but our, one of our main things is courses, and these courses are four hours, so they're a lot shorter than, say, a Coursera course, which might run over a few months. Um, we have people like you know, Charlotte Wickham, Hadley has a course. Um, I'm working on a course right now on categorical variables. And the way these courses work is you watch videos and then you do these um, interactive exercises right in your browser. So it's a nice way if you're just starting to learn, like R, Python, or SQL, uh, to not have to download anything uh, and to get immediate feedback. All right. In conclusion, uh, I wanted to say again that you know R has, we're, we're great. We have, as Christine Zhang here is sharing, we have all these awesome stickers. Again, you can find some of them in the back. Um, cool package names. But, so maybe, maybe that's how we can help attract people initially, but really staying for the friendly community and happy workflow. And that's part of why I love so much being a part of the R community. Um, I work with Our Ladies Global Organization advancing um, gender equality in the R community. And we've had um, such an outpouring of support from a lot of other people in terms of sponsorships. And I, I really think that just shows um, that R is, is really the people helping lead R are, do not want to be elitist. They don't want to exclude others. R is meant for people who, um, in some cases, are never going to be professional developers. But, and that's kind of what the tidyverse is about, is uh, even, even if you don't want to go deep into, um, let's say, like advanced programming, which you definitely can in R, the tidyverse gets you doing powerful things very quickly. And with that, um, I want to say you can find my slides uh, very soon on this link tiny.cc New York R Talk. Uh, I blog about some of these topics, uh, like uh, finding data science community, making R faster on my blog, Hooked on Data. You can find me on Twitter, Robinson underscore ES. And with that, thank you all so much. <laughs>